There's another environment that is also important in arid settings, and that's actually the lagoon. So let's look at what happens in a lagoon now. So we move away from the coastal setting and we go straight into the lagoon. Now imagine that you're in arid condition on a continent and that you have a lagoon that has a restricted inflow of new seawater. That's typically what you will find on a rimmed margin because your rim can be uh, shoals or corals that effectively restrict the quantity, the total volume of, of um, non-evaporated water being recharged from the open ocean into the back lagoon. Keep in mind, certainly here in Saudi or anywhere in the Middle East, because we're looking at Epiric Ramp, those lagoon that the lagoon that we talked about are actually the shelf and they're hundreds of kilometers wide. So they're huge. Now, what happened to the surface water that enters through the sill? Well, it's going to flow towards the, the uh, land, pushed by the winds. And throughout its flow, it will undergo evaporation. And as it evaporates, it becomes denser and denser and denser and actually more concentrated on ionic species such as magnesium. At some point, when you reach the end of that lagoon, those water are so dense, so evaporated, that they sink because they are denser than the, uh, than the, the other fluids. So they sink and come to the bottom of the system. And they form what is known as a pecnocline, which is a density-driven uh, differentiation between the top water, which are less dense, and the bottom water that are more dense. And those dense water then flow back towards the sill, towards the, the uh, open ocean. But of course, because the sill is there, the only way out for those dense water to go, they cannot go up, they're too dense, there's lighter water on top, they cannot displace that light water. So what they do is they have to seep through the sediments. And this is why this type of circulation is known as seepage reflux. Seepage because it seeps through the sediments and reflux because as the water moves towards the continent and then refluxes back towards the open marine system. And the really interesting thing about seepage reflux is that you force some magnesium rich water to go through some limestone. And often in the lagoon, those limestone are relatively tight. They are muds. They are, they are lots of, uh, they're very rich in micrite. And the potential to dolomitize those microites and those lagoonal sediments and thus to transform them from a tight, maybe even a, a, a seal type of lithology into a nice crystalline dolomite with lots of intercrystalline uh, porosity is not zero. And so you can actually improve reservoir property quite a bit through this process. And here's an example of exactly that process in action. This is the San Andreas Formation in Texas. You're already familiar with this. We went there a few lessons ago. And the point of this diagram is to show that when you have seepage reflux um, taking place, the initial fluids that comes out, at least that's the, the model in the San Andreas Formation, that comes out and seeps through the sediments, are so rich in dolomite, so super saturated in dolomite that you will dolomitize the limestone, which is a good thing for porosity and permeability. But at the same time, because you're so super saturated, you will start to precipitate a dolomite cement. And by this, you will basically occlude all of the porosity. And this is known as over dolomitization. It's the process of dolomitizing the limestone, but also precipitating a dolomitic cement out of this supersaturated solution, which occludes porosity. But as these brines move away from their initial site of formation, and as they precipitate the cement on the way, they become progressively less and less supersaturated with respect to dolomite. And there's a point away from the zone of formation of the, of the brines when they've seeped through this limestone long enough, where they effectively have the potential to dolomitize the limestone, but they no longer can precipitate a cement straight in the pore space. And then you get those nice porous dolomites. And these are actually excellent reservoirs in the San Andreas Formation. 
But as you move away from this zone of porous dolomite, you lose more and more of your magnesium because you've dolomitized the, the, the limestone. And so eventually you end up in a zone where the, the brines no longer are active and you have non-porous limestone. So this porous dolomite zone is kind of a Goldilocks zone where you are not over dolomitizing because you're not super saturated or too much super saturated with respect to dolomite, but also you're saturated enough that you can dolomitize the limestone and not end up with a non-porous limestone. So let's talk a little bit about the elephant in the room, the uh, reservoirs, the giant reservoirs of Saudi Arabia, and how this notion of um, arid dolomitization might play a role for this particular depositional setting. And of course, we need to talk about Gawar. So here you see the different uh, reservoirs. The, the green reservoirs are oil reservoirs in Saudi Arabia. And it's a, it should be apparent to you immediately when you look at their um, orientation that they follow anticline. And if we look specifically at Gawar, it's absolutely enormous. It's roughly 50 kilometers across and about 250 kilometers long. So this is a, a reservoir at a mind-blowing scale. It's fair to say that there's complication in the reservoir and multiple um, structural parts of the reservoir and Saudi Aramco actually considers Gawar as multiple reservoirs that, are, that have different production strategy. But it is an absolutely giant reservoir. So let's look at what makes up this reservoir. And it's actually the Arab formation. So we're already familiar with the Arab formation. You, you remember that we have limestone member and evaporite members that are sandwiched together. And then at the top, we have the Hith formation, which is the ultimate seal for the Arab formation. So this is like an archetypical uh, evaporative depositional setting for arid carbonates during high stand. And then eventually you get to a point where in the high stand, you have uh, too much um, evaporation and desiccation of the lagoon and precipitation of evaporites. And Gawar is effectively a, an anticline, as we've already mentioned. But if you were to remove this, this uh, post-depositional tectonic, this becomes essentially a, a prograding ramp with the margin of the ramp being formed from the cladocropsis and the oolitic uh, belt. So lots of ooids here at the top and the front of uh, Gawar. So a, a very classic ramp deposit. In fact, um, probably one of the most classic ramp deposits.